back. Hi. Hello and welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery. I am Lady Glockenflecken, also known as Kristen Flannery. And we are excited for you to be here with us. Woo-woo. It's January. Mm-hmm. And uh, are, do you like January as a month? Uh, no, I gotta be honest. I What's do not. It? You know, the only cold? month worse than January is February, and they come back to back. How can you say back. that? So, how can you say that when our children's well, birthdays you know, are in it's, February? That's not the part I'm talking about. <laughs> it's just, it's dark, it's cold, unless you're in the southern hemisphere, in which case I congratulate you. I think January is worse than February. Well, because February, there's like a, a maybe, light at the end of the tunnel right. in February. It's like March is coming up. Yeah. And then you get spring. Uh, but January is like you get you're through the holidays. Stuck in it. And you're just that's it's I've never it. understood why we put so many holidays before January. Like they should all be And January has thirty one days. Yeah. Whose idea was that? Right. It should be January uh, where we get all of the like extra lights and the parties. Why didn't we why don't all I guess I'm I'm like being very um you know self-centered here and assuming that everybody has the same like temperature calendar as we do here. Right. You have to uh <laughs> know that the world is a big place and there other a, people are in different seasons. A some a southern hemisphere does exist. Uh, uh which is I have, I have to remind myself we've been there. We have. We went yep. to the southern hemisphere mm-hmm. once. But uh, even had we not, it would still exist. And there are people that live there. Okay, one thing we haven't actually like talked about lately is in like several years is our thoughts on like New Year's, mm. New Year's Eve. Yeah. When was the last time we actually it like used to be one of my favorite holidays? And now it's not. We, now it's, just... it's been a while since we've like done a now we put on uh, the um, because since we have kids. Mm-hmm. We do the early, the one that you can just tee up yeah, at any time on Netflix. Thank goodness for YouTube. You can find a Is countdown YouTube, anytime. <laughs> one of the two. You can just like find a countdown. Mm-hmm. And you just like, it's like nine o'clock in the evening. You're like, oh, it's New Year's. Let's just let's, call it the like, countdown, it's kids. It's like the kid version of it's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. You know, for drinking. It's the kid version of, well, it's midnight somewhere. It's New Year's Eve somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then and then you, you go to bed early. That's it's, right. I think it's great. But yeah. we're also... Now it's just sort of depressing, though, because you do really want to just go to bed early. But who like who in, do people still like the crowds, like the New Year's Eve? That's a good like, question. After COVID, I'm not sure. What do you guys think? I've never liked the crowds, but I did like you know the the you go out and you have fun with people that you like, and you there's all this like hope and promise of this arbitrary New Year. <laughs> I'm not really sure why we celebrate when then, we do. And then you go and start exercising for a and few then, weeks. Well, I never did that. That's never that, the New Year's no. resolutions. Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Well, How about you? No. Yeah. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> what does right. that say about us? Do no, we I lack commitment, stick to itiveness? Oh, of course. Hmm. No, I mean we've 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 stuck to this podcast for over well, a year. Look, it's the twenty third <laughs> now, so by now everyone has already fallen off their resolution wagon. Yeah. Hey, tell us what your resolution was, and if you've already fallen off, we yeah. want to hear that. Uh, and knock, what knock did you win? At human content dot com. <laughs> All right, let's talk about our guest today. All right. So we have Uche, Doctor Uche Blackstock. Yes, I love her. We've, I love what she's doing. We've, we've seen her on social her for media a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I first came across her on. Uh, she's on Instagram and uh, Twitter. Mm-hmm. Oh, back when it was Twitter, and uh, just has a, a very interesting perspective as a black physician, black woman physician, mm-hmm. and um, um, has written a book. Has this consulting firm trying to help healthcare organizations uh, promote equity and inclusiveness in their organizations, which uh, we, I think we need a lot of. And so right. um, it was just fascinating to hear her story. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not only is she a black female physician, um, she has a twin sister who is also a black female physician and their mother was a black female physician. Yes. So um, that's a really interesting perspective then of this like multi-generational experience of being a black female physician. And yeah. I think that comes with a lot of, insight uh that that we are lucky that she's sharing with us all yep so let's uh let's get to the interview let's do it here is dr uche blackstock today's episode is brought to you by the nuance dragon ambient experience or dax for short to learn more about how dax copilot can help reduce burnout and restore the joy of practicing medicine stick around after the episode or visit nuance.com slash discover dax 
That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. All right, we are here with Dr. Blackstock. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a, I see you on, on Twitter. I've seen you for years on there, and now it's yeah. finally great to get to talk to you in person. Same, same. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, I, I guess I would just want to start. Um, I want to, oh, you've got a, a, a very interesting kind of pathway through <laughs> the medical field. And, you know, um, and so I thought we could just start at the beginning and, and your motivation, what got you into medicine in the first place? I know you come from a, a, a medical family. Yes. Yeah. Um, my mother was a physician. Um, she was triple board certified internal triple. medicine. I know, I know. I know. She was oh definitely like not an overachiever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what were the three, three things? Internal medicine, geriatrics, and nephrology. Oh, wow. I smart, know. Smart lady. Yeah. And she was the first person <laughs> um, from her family to finish college. She was born to a single wow. mom here in Brooklyn. She had five siblings, um, born on public assistance, like really did not yeah. have an easy life, but was really, really bright um, and determined and loved science. So, um, when she went to Brooklyn college, she majored in biology and had a professor there that was like, you know, you're really smart. You should apply to medical school. And she got into all of her medical schools, um, oh, wow. and, and ended up at Harvard med school. Um, but anyway, after Harvard, she came back to the same neighborhood that she grew up in, in Brooklyn. Like she could have gone anywhere else. And uh -huh. she, worked for many years in the same community she grew up in. And so like, obviously for, you know, I have a twin sister, Oni, yeah. who's also a physician. Obviously she was a huge <laughs> influence on us. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I can't imagine. Okay. So uh, uh, triple board certified and raising twins. Like I have two kids and just a regular job and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know that's, how she did that. That's impressive. Yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, I think she was really determined for mm -hmm. us to have like a different upbringing than she did. And mm -hmm. so even though, yeah, even though she probably was super exhausted and had all of these commitments, I never felt like she was not there for us. Like she was, she always right. managed to like be there for us. So yeah, you know. I mean, clearly you, yes. she's influenced you very much, <laughs> both of you. So that's yeah, incredible. yeah, we would visit her at work. We would go to her meetings. Like she would, she would take us everywhere. We'd go to conferences with her. So it kind of felt like the natural thing. Oh, yeah. Did I'm she give you too. Did right. she give you whiteboard presentations about hyponatremia? Is that was that part of your <laughs> you, upbringing you, you, as well? You know what? Um, <laughs> she did definitely explain to us how the nephron works. And as yeah. we know, the kidney is like, is super complicated so <laughs> that's right yeah, yeah so i'm not going to pretend to know anything about it so i know you are you're very highly specialized uh, yeah. in, the, in the eye right yes that's exactly. a really polite way of saying he doesn't know very much uh, no no it's but it's, it's true other than it, ophthalmology it's, it's a, I, I, I always say below the nasal bridge i'm not i i he's useless i'm limited yeah <laughs> but um so so what how i guess do you remember a moment when you were like, oh, this is, it sounds like it's basically always been, you're going to go into medicine. This is what you wanted to do. Yeah. You saw your mom do it. You were on yeah. the path. Yeah. I feel like I can't even remember like a, a certain moment, yeah. but I think from my mom, I just saw like, it was like being a physician was just such a great way to um, be in service to your community, um, yeah. to do something good. Um, she had a really special connection with all her patients. They would always be giving her like cookies and blankets, blankets they knitted and gifts. And so it just seemed like a really rewarding job. And I was like, I want to be just like her. <laughs> but you went, you went, uh, you didn't go the internal medicine route. I you did went not the emergency medicine route. I just couldn't, you know, those around the, the rounds, <laughs> yes, yes. The, rounding. You couldn't do the rounding. I just didn't have the attention span for rounding for hours on patients. Yeah. It takes a special kind of person, I think like internal medicine they have a they have they they want to be doing that <laughs> if you're not exactly. that kind of person then exactly mm -hmm. and I just like when I was a first year medical student I shadowed one of our anatomy instructors um mm -hmm. who was just one of our most popular instructors and he let us shadow him at mass general and for a shift and I remember on this shift we saw so many different types of patients like people who came in with just you know cold, cold symptoms other people another person had pneumothorax and I was like, and, and had to have a chest tube put in. And I was like, this is 
so cool. Like I, I need to do this. And I love the idea of just helping um, all comers. Like, you know, yeah. you know, everyone goes to the ER, you know, regardless of insurance status, you know, whatever mm-hmm. issues they're having, they come to the ER and it's your job to take care of them. Yeah. yeah. And did you know that you wanted to, because you said your mom, you know, she, she stayed in the the same you know yeah. um uh, community. neighborhood and yeah. community that she she grew up in did you know that that was what where you were heading to is to practice in the same place you grew up you know what so i i i'm i'm not as um what's what's the word like deter <laughs> like i'm determined but my mom had like definitely thicker skin than i did and so mm-hmm. i when i went back um i went back to brooklyn after medical school at harvard to train at kings county suny downstate which is where my mom had practiced all these years and oh, wow. for training it was amazing like i mean literally we saw everything, got to do everything. It was really an honor to take care of those patients. Mm-hmm. But I have to admit to you, after my four years of residency there, I was burnt out. Like, you know, yeah. I had to push all my patients to CAT scan. Like I was transport, I was phlebotomy because um, it's, it's an under-resourced hospital. So you end up doing a lot, which as a resident is great because you kind of are learning a lot. But I knew that as an attending physician, I'm like, I don't think that I have the wherewithal to to do all of that. I knew I wanted to stay in academic medicine, though. Right. So, so Kai, you were doing you were doing blood draws and stuff. As yeah, well. I'm I'm still really good. Like you know that the yeah. muscle memory, <laughs> muscle memory. Listen, I could put an IV in someone's like in a vein that I saw in someone's finger. Oh wow! I'm I'm so jealous of like I wish I had that ability. Even though I don't, I wouldn't have the opportunity to use it very uh, often yeah. as an ophthalmologist. It's still like. Yeah, I never got good at IVs. And so um it makes such a difference too on the patient side of things. <laughs> I'm not in medicine, so I am only speaking about it from from my perspective. But like I've gotten so many pokes over the years, and the ones that can do it without you even hardly noticing, oh, yeah. uh, you're just like so grateful to those people, even just things like vaccines, right? Like some people you just don't even notice. Yeah. And those people, it's like, can how do I make an appointment with you every time? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it actually, makes a big difference. It really, really does. And we had a lot of patients who were on dialysis, so they it was really, really yeah. hard to get access on them because they had been hospitalized so many times. Um, and I literally could, like, I feel like take a needle and just go whoop. And and, and so that was my greatest pride in residency that I couldn't yeah. find, you know, a vein on anybody. <laughs> what a what a flex too. It's yeah. like, you know, no one else. Oh, yeah, let's, let's get Dr. Blackstock in here. Yeah. She knows what I she's hope doing. they gave you a really cool nickname for that. <laughs> you know, actually, right. all, actually, all the residents got really good at it. We all were really good yeah, at yeah. it just oh, because nice. we were so understaffed. Yeah. yeah. Now, you didn't also have to perform your own gram stains, did you? I didn't, the- but I had to mix my own like gastrographin for CAT scans. Like, if patients were getting oh, a CAT God. scan, they would really? like track down the gastrographin, dilute it in water. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I guess I mean, what. What a good experience, though, you know, like to to know what it's like to be in that kind of resource, you know. Right. Yeah. And I mean, like, if I could, I probably would have gotten their medication, but I didn't have access to the Pixis. <laughs> you know, we have access <laughs> to the right. Pixis. So, um, yeah. but yeah, I would have done all that, too. I used to have patients or a, pa- a patient that wasn't mine next to one of my patients that would say, hey, doc, can can you be my doc, too? Because I see you, like, running around everywhere doing everything for your patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and so you mentioned, you said you were, you knew you wanted to do academics. What was it? What was it that oh. was like, oh, academics? Because I'm the, I was the opposite. I was like, early on, I was like, no academics for me. That's not my, you know, not my bag. Yeah. I, um, so my mom was in academics, but then also I always, I just loved the idea of being in a really, what I thought was intellectually stimulating environment where you're doing a little bit of teaching, a little bit of clinical work, a little bit of research. I felt like that would keep me kind of, mm. you know, interested and engaged. Um, so I actually did an emergency ultrasound fellowship after residency um, because in emergency medicine, we actually use the ultrasound. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. you know, like we actually, actually, I can diagnose a retinal detachment and a vitreous yeah. hemorrhage, hemorrhage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys are good at it. Yeah. It's my okay. understanding that uh, ultrasound fellowships are required now of all residents. I'm, I'm joking. Oh, yes. But, yeah, the, uh, no. No, 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 in emergency <laughs> medicine. <laughs> uh, ultrasound rotation is required of all emergency medicine residents. Yeah, it's it's what you can, but it really is impressive. I, I'll say, uh, even as an ophthalmologist, I see it. Yeah, you're really pretty good at at diagnosing yeah. lots of things with ultrasound. We, we, so yeah, I mean, 
you know, trauma patients, you know, yeah. gallstones, blood clots. Um, we were able to do echoes on our own patients. So that's part of our workup. Mm-hmm. And so I did an emergency ultrasound fellowship, which is like a year long. And then I went to, went into academics as faculty. Oh, gotcha. And what, what was your goal to be? Cause you, you had an interest in research, obviously. Yeah. Uh, what was it that, that you were wanting to pursue in that area? Yeah, actually. So what I did when I went you know, into my faculty position, I actually was very interested in medical education and using mm-hmm. ultrasound to teach medical students about anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. So, you know, this idea of being able to visualize all of these internal structures that they're learning about either on cadavers or in the classroom, mm-hmm. but actually to be able to see the heart beating and to see diastole and to see systole and um, to see what ascites, you know, fluid in the belly looks like, I think I thought would be a great way to complement like the traditional curriculum. So I developed a, curic- a four-year curriculum at the med school I was at um, oh, in nice. ultrasound. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, all the all the emergency medicine physicians that are listening are pumping their fists. Yes. <laughs> yes. Way to go. That's awesome. That's... Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And and, and just, just to see the look in the medical student's eyes of like that light bulb going off and be like, uh-huh. oh, like now I get it. Yeah. 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 yeah something, I mean, that makes a big difference to be able to see things. I don't know. I've been, you know, following along with your beef with ultrasound and, and we've <laughs> oh, had. Wait, you have a beef with well, ultrasound? Well, hold on. Hold on. It's like a, it's like a play beef. It's like a, I mean, you it's, know, it's, a tongue in cheek. So, some of it. Sort some of. of. Right. There, there's some things and we've, we've, we've talked about this before. Some uses of ultrasound on the eye, like traumatic eye injuries, that there's just oh. not like. I just it's every not time necessary. though that we talk to somebody who's using ultrasound oh. and talking about ultrasound, I'm like, "What's your problem, dude? You're <laughs> just wrong I, hey, on I, this no, issue." No, no, I am on the record. <laughs> I am, I am pro ultrasound uh, yeah. for because you you can you see so much with and honestly, if I had to try to diagnose internal organ things, yeah, I would absolutely use ultrasound. I'd go right for it. Absolutely. So I'm, but, I'm, I'm on board. But. but. But it's just some of the eye things that are that are out there in the ultras in the emergency world, uh, particularly with regard to eye traumatic eye injuries, yes. like open globes, like people yes. talk about diagnosing an open right. like to, that's to, to, like to put gel and put a probe on yeah, on, an on an open, eye that's open. Yes. No, not that's, a great that idea. Sense. That makes sense. That, no, no, I <laughs> I agree with that. That makes but sense the, to me. But the, what you're talking about with especially in areas that that don't have. I, I've I've come back a little bit on this because I, I have gotten pushed back uh, on my ultrasound thoughts, and I I, I listen I listen to people other points of view, and so um, in in like especially rural areas or people, areas that right. maybe don't have like ophthalmologists like ready to come in at a moment's notice, to be able to diagnose a retinal detachment or a vitreous hemorrhage or something like that is I think very a very useful skill. So I mean I just I kind of would like to have an ultrasound just to play with. <laughs> Listen, when I, okay, so, so I actually, you know, they have like, um, I forgot the name of the company, but they have like, you know, handheld ones. When I was, when I was pregnant with my second child, I had one at home and every, I mean, at like, at least I know, I know, (laughs) I'd be like, wait, let me see how this little guy is doing. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, it just, I was just, I was a bundle of nerves during during my pregnancies. Yeah. Yeah, You're still, you're still in there. You're still moving around. Your heart's still beating. Okay, great. (laughs) Let's check it. So at, at some point though, cause you, so it sounds like you're really, you know, at some point enjoying this, of uh, the academic life and then things changed. It sounds like, right. Yeah, You, you know, I, I think also like this idea that I didn't think of doing anything else other than academics, you know, sometimes you're on that, you're just on this path. Mm-hmm. And I feel like definitely in medicine that happens a lot. You're kind of like, I'm chugging along. I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And then you kind of never really ask yourself, well, like, am I, am I happy? Like, do I feel fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing a, a lot of medical education work and, you know, yeah, it's, sometimes I felt like a little bit under, underappreciated, undervalued. And then I was handpicked for this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion role at the mm-hmm. med school I was at. I was super excited about it, but it ended up kind of just being like a figurehead role. Like they didn't really expect me to do anything. Mm-hmm. And that was like a bit that was a, like a huge letdown for me yeah. um, because I, because I, you know, because while I was interested in medical education, really my heart, my heart is really in diversity, equity, and inclusion and thinking about how we can make academic medicine, healthcare overall, you know, address some of the racial health inequities that we see sure. um, in this country. And so I really wasn't able to do that in, 
an authentic way in the academic setting I was in. And then I just started thinking more broadly. I said, am I going to be able to do this anywhere? So I, so I founded my own company. Like <laughs> so, That's amazing. I know. Like I still <laughs> pinch myself. Um, it'll be five years old in March. It's called Advancing oh, wow. Health Equity. It's a consulting firm. That's and that's amazing. Know, that's great. I know. Congratulations. And we, and we on work that. with healthcare organizations, academic medical centers around health equity and DEI. And I'm doing basically everything that I've always wanted to do. That must have been a a, a really hard decision to leave academia. Uh, in fact, I, I just saw something. You it might have been you that retweeted it actually, uh, that I saw. Um, uh, about like one in three either physicians or people in academia are thinking about leaving academia within the next couple of years, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, and I have to say, I'm not, I wasn't surprised by that stat because I've had people that I, I've known that left before me and left after me. Um, but for me, it was, a, it was like a, a big decision, but that kind of, it took me like a year or two to get there um, because mm -hmm. I actually hadn't thought about, I'm like, what am I like, what else am I going to do? And even when I started my consulting firm, I had just started it as something to do part time, not something to do full time. Um, I, I could not have ever imagined that that would be the case as it is now. But I also think, you know, in academic medicine, it's you feel like you have to always prove yourself like you yeah. have to be there's certain criteria for what being productive looks like, you know, if, if it's publishing, I always felt like clinical work was not very valued and also mentoring. Um, and teaching was not as valued as much, even though that's, I feel like I really enjoyed those two the most. Um, so I kind of felt like I was not in alignment. Like, I feel like I was in an environment where I could really thrive. And so when I left academic medicine in December, 2019, I was going to work part-time in urgent care. And then the other time on my consulting firm. And then, as you know, in March, 2020, everything went sideways. Yeah. And for a few months, I was like, wait a minute, because urgent care, we actually got really busy. So many people were, you know, it was in New York City. So many patients were coming to urgent care instead of the ER. Oh. Um, so we saw a lot of really sick patients and they asked me to pick up more shifts. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. So I left like <laughs> yeah. my multiple roles and titles in academic medicine to work in urgent care. Um, but then, yeah. you know, um, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor cases happened. Mm -hmm. And I actually started getting so many requests for the consulting for my mm -hmm. company because a lot of healthcare organizations wanted to do the work. So since then, I have been busy. And then I also got into um, being a medical contributor for MSNBC because I was just like writing op-eds about what I was seeing. So and it was just amazing because I had this opportunity to I remember my agent said, Uche, they actually want to hear your perspective. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> I was so used to, I was so used to being in academic medicine where right. you kind of like become an automaton and you're just kind of like, the, the, you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, you have you know, the like so, scripted things that you say all the time and yeah. they don't really want you to make any waves. Right, exactly. And, and so my agent's like, Uche, you can say more. You can say what you actually think. And I was like, oh my God, really? Yeah. And so... <laughs> Yeah. And so the rest is history. It's been yeah. amazing. I, I love the work that I do with my consulting firm. I do miss the students, um, working with the students in academic medicine and the, tra and the trainees. They're so just, they mm -hmm. give me so much hope and, you know, seeing their, their evolution and their growth is such a privilege. I can relate to so much of your story. I wasn't in um, academic medicine, but I was in academics. So I was in a PhD program and oh. it's just so so similar of like what I really loved about it was the the learning and the teaching and the mentoring and the students and all of that. And, and I could have done that forever, but I really didn't actually like the research part of it very much. And then it's very similar to you kind of, you know, once you see behind the curtain of something I became very disillusioned with yes. kind of, you know, how it all works, the nuts and bolts on the back end that you don't necessarily see on the brochures. Right. And so um, so I ended up leaving as well. And I think that a lot of people, at, at least this was true um, when I left and and sounds like perhaps maybe still true when you left. Um, a lot of people feel like you can't leave because you've you've I know. put so you have so much sunk cost into it. Right. Yes. And that yes. there's no other thing you can do. So there's no way out. We're never taught about alternative options for what we've done to that point in our training and careers. 
And so it just feels like you are stuck. Um, And and it's so crazy that you would feel stuck because you've accomplished so much. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's this very twisted backwards way of thinking, but it is so ingrained in us uh, that I think it it really pulls people in into that way of thinking. It can lead to some really bad places because, you know, it becomes so much part of your identity, right? That Mm. I am an academic. And so that's hard to separate from your own sense of identity. It because there's all this like shame and guilt if you want to leave because of all of the resources and time and energy that people have invested in you doing this job. Right. And there's, there's very much a culture of like, we're raising you up this way. You know, it's, it's almost like a dysfunctional family sort of a thing, right? Like, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah. I resonate with, with, um, so much of what you say resonates, um, with me. Um, I actually had like, so this is very personal, but I had actually gone up for a promotion from assistant to associate professor. And my department had unanimously voted the promotion through. And they were like, no, Usha, you've done so much for the school. And when I first went up to this, the school's committee for promotion, I actually was denied um, my promotion. And what? I remember my chair calling me and just being like, Uchi, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. And I remember someone telling me, someone who was on the committee who did vote for me said, I would understand if she left because this is feel this is such a slap in the face. Yeah. And but but it just made me realize that like even though you 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 may expend a lot of energy and do a lot of work that you think is meaningful, like a lot of these the in, people in institutional leadership they they might not necessarily think that work is valuable, right? Right. And so what happened was a few months later, I had a, a lot of really wonderful supporters and I went back up for promotion and it went through. But I think I never really got, I never got over that yeah. experience. It kind of felt like, it felt like a slap in the face after just putting hours and hours of work yeah. sure. um, into, into what I was doing. But also the other thing is one of my friends, I had a conversation with her about what am I, what am I going to do if I leave? Because I feel like I need an affiliation, like an academic yeah, affiliation. Exactly. Like if I don't have an academic affiliation, who am I? Right. <laughs> but like you were saying, like, I was just so yeah. wrapped up that was part of my identity. Yeah. I was an academic. Um, so I had to like do that unlearning and relearning of like Uche, like you are awesome and amazing on your own. Like right. you do not need an affiliation to be, to feel valued or appreciated. You like, are you the you affiliation. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah. You stand on your own. I mean, for real, yeah. you are, I mean, you are a name unto yourself, Thank you, you know, Thank you. you do not need an institution, but yeah. it is scary to take that step. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was so scared. I, I was like, I had bills to pay. But listen, I mean, and one thing I also didn't recognize is that when you get out of your comfort zone, sometimes like there literally is abundance out there because yes. you, you actually fall into alignment. You're doing things that you love and more opportunities come. Yeah. Exactly. And when I, I know when I speak at uh, conferences now, when people want my affiliation, I just write TikTok. So I, you can, <laughs> you really can have yes. uh, any kind of affiliation. It, it doesn't, if your work yeah. speaks for itself. Yeah. Here what's I important. am just working out of our house <laughs> for our tiny little LLC. I put that on my, when I publish in yes. journals, like Absolutely. it really, I mean, we're joking and it's funny, but also it is true. There is so much out there that you can do with the skill. There's so many transferable skills that you get yes. in an academic career and training. Uh, and so I think, I hope people look to you as inspiration for what to do if they feel like they're stuck. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I also hope, you know, I, I say I have this guilt about leaving my students and mm-hmm. trainees, but I also realize that I'm also, um, my, the path I've taken is an opportunity for them to see that there are other yeah. different paths that you can take, um, in medicine. That right. you, there's not one way to do things. I want to talk a little bit more about your consulting. Cause I find this very interesting, yeah. uh, starting that kind of career. Let's take a quick break and we'll come right back. Hey, Kristen, doesn't it seem like AI can do anything? It seems that way. It's everywhere. It is. But have you heard of Precision? No, tell me. This is the first ever electronic health record integrated infectious disease AI platform. Mm, That sounds fancy. It's really exciting. Uh, So, for any specific patient, it takes all the patient's clinical data and automatically highlights better antibiotic coverage in real time. Oh, nice. Yeah. It empowers clinicians to save more lives while also working more efficiently Mm. and quickly. To see a demo, go to precision.com slash KKH. That's precision spelled with an X instead of an E. So P-R-X-C-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash KKH. 
Okay, we are back with Dr. Blackstock. So Uche, uh, I, I, I really want to know about this, your consulting firm. What exactly does that mean? What are you, who's reaching out to you and how are you helping them? Yeah, so essentially we get client requests from a range of healthcare associated organizations, whether they be academic institutions, governmental agencies like mm-hmm. departments of health, um, nonprofits like um, like. Planned Parenthood is one of our, our, our clients, um, but they basically come to us because they want to really work on like their workplace culture, how to make it more diverse, more equitable, so that the work they do can really um, be in service to the communities mm-hmm. and the patients that they take care of. So we essentially do, we go in, we do surveys, we do interviews with leadership, we do mm-hmm. focus groups with staff. Um, we also do leadership coaching around equity and how to be an inclusive leader. Um, And then a lot of times they ask us to stay on longer. Um, So we do capacity building, just help them to function better as um, an organization focused on equity, but they're all health related. Mm. And, you know, there is, what do you call it? Um, What kind of bias, like, like selection bias and that the people who come to, well, people come to us, like the organizations, they are interested in doing the work and they're very much ready to do the work. So it's always, yeah. it's always like very much um, a pleasure. So usually we have engagements from three months to actually a few years. Like I'm oh, working wow. with um, the New York State Department of Health um, on a health equity wide assessment. We're doing trainings with their staff. We're doing focus groups and then we'll compile like a strategy and plan for them or, or three to five years for how to think and focus on health equity. I, I assume there are probably the same type of problems and things to work on that come up every single time, right? So do you have a couple like concrete, you know, examples of, of things that you've really focused yeah. on with these? Well, the interesting thing is like <laughs> when we do the focus groups with staff, we're like, okay, did you share this with your leadership? And a lot of times they feel, you know, a little intimidated and scared to do so. So I think like, it's great to have an outside external consulting firm Mm. come in and talk to the leadership and be like, you know, this is what we found. These are the patterns that we found in the organization. Um, We think it's really important for you to get constant feedback from your staff about how things are going. Um, You know, look at the patterns of hiring, look at patterns of who's leaving your organization. Mm -hmm. Um, So we do a lot of like one-on-ones with leadership about how to really listen to your staff. And like a lot of our recommendations are not, um, rocket science. They actually are a lot, very, very common sense. But if they had listened to their staff and, and employees, they probably would have been able to like, you know, avoid a lot of these um, issues. Um, and then the other thing is we do a lot of trainings with people just around um, the history of health inequities and, and racism in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And it's really wonderful because it's very eye-opening for people when we give them a safe space just to talk about like what they're learning, how it impacts their work and, you know, how they're going to move forward. Um, and we just, we work with organizations around their visions, their missions, um, even hiring and recruiting. So whatever their needs are, we work with them in that respect. Do you find that they, I mean, I can see how, depending on how it goes, this could be very discouraging or encouraging work, right? Like you go in and you see like, look, I know exactly what you need to do. And then you hand it back to them and then it's on them whether they do it or not. So I know. Do you find it like, are they doing it? (laughs) Yeah. I would say for the most part, it is very encouraging. Okay, good. You know, I think, I think, you know, every now and then sometimes we'll get a client that's like, you know what, I think we're going to stop doing work now because like everyone's getting really overwhelmed because that's the thing people have their regular work to do. And so how do you integrate it in a way that prioritizes it, but is not stretching them thin. But I would say overall, like, you know, when we we check back in with organizations to see how things are going, they are so grateful. They're, they're very, very grateful. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's such a a wonderful feeling. Yeah. It's, it's such a, hmm, I get on too many soapboxes, but one of mine, we we (laughs) used to live in Iowa and I used to work at the university of Iowa and I'm not saying them in particular, but just because of that history, um, you know, I've kind of kept up with what's going on in Iowa and they've actually recently like outlawed DEI initiatives and things like that. And it's just so, first of all, that's incredibly stupid and mean and irresponsible. Yeah. yeah. But also, like, 
it was always this I, this attitude of like that this is something extra that we're doing. And, and what you just said about sometimes they're like, oh, everybody has too much work. You know, it reminds me of that mindset. And it's like, no, it shouldn't be something extra. It should be something that's just part of everything yeah. that you're doing. Right. Right. Because when it's part of actually every it helps everyone. Right. It helps. It helps the whole organization. And I, that, I think that's what people notice once we work with them. They're like, oh, this is just these are just good practices, yeah. organizational practices to have in general. Right. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And so, and you've, you've, um, you know, taken all this experience now and I, I and I assume, in, you know, included all of this experience and to put all this into writing this book that's coming yes. out. I think actually the day that this episode comes out is yeah. oh, on the 23rd, yeah. Yeah. January 23rd. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Thank this is, you. this yeah. is, this is that's perfect. Awesome. And so, uh, I, I would love to hear just about the origin of, of this, of your memoir and yes. yeah, is this something you've been thinking about writing for a while? And. So can I tell you, this is, this is the other thing I, I love to share with your audience is that you never know like who's listening to you. Like we have these platforms and we want to use them for good. So actually my book agent in the summer of 2020 heard me on a radio show. I was talking about COVID and she literally like cold emailed me and said, Hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? I think that you have a story to tell. I looked you up. I follow you on Twitter and, and I, I checked her out. I'm like, okay, she's legit. And we, we had a conversation and she's like, I think you should write a book about, you know, being a second generation black woman physician and using your mother and your own personal and professional experiences to talk about the history of racism in medicine and even like what's happening now in COVID. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we, 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 wrote, we, we wrote a proposal together. I met with nine publishers and went up for auction. Oh, wow. Like, I know. Wow. I know. I know. I like th these are things I could have never imagined, yeah. right? But it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't like veered off that path that I thought I was going to take. Yeah. Right. But um but yes, yeah, so it took me a year and a half to write the book. A, a lot of like soul searching. I interviewed my dad, my sister, um even like you know, some physicians that are experts in like the health equity space and really what it is, it's a combination of things. It's a love letter to my mother cuz she actually passed away when we were 9 19 years old uh, of acute myelogenous leukemia. Um, but she obviously has, has had a tremendous influence on us. Um, she wrote an essay about women in medical education while she was still alive. So I was able to use some of her writing oh. um, in, in the book and draw connections to now. There's a lot of history and social commentary in it. And then there's a call to action um, for, for people in healthcare, for every segment of the population, policymakers, about how we can address health equity. But I really wrote it for a broad audience to yeah. help people connect the dots for how we got to this place today where, you know, Black birthing people are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy related complications. It's higher than that of like low income countries. Yeah. So I wanted just to make sure that a broad audience, not just people in, in medicine or healthcare, but people in the public who care about equity and justice, like understood how we got here and what they can do to make a difference. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that hear, you know, uh, uh, racism in medicine and are kind of shocked by that, right? They because yes. the 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 natural assumption is that, uh, you know, medicine it's just there to help and 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 where you know that's the goal and and don't don't think about that. There's this this background. Um, yes. For, yeah. This. Do you think yeah. that most people are shocked by that or? Is it most white people are shocked by well, that? Well, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm sure mostly white people. Yeah. I mean, genuine but... question, because like I'll use being a woman as an example, right? Like there are things about our culture that I didn't realize until I was, you know, in my 30s that right. were happening around me to me, even though they were happening right. to me. And I was kind of in this system where you just drink the water, right? It all seems normal. Right. So, so it's a genuine question. I mean, I would, yeah. I would imagine I mean, that people who experience it would be more aware of it, but yes, I, I mean, I, I would say that definitely there's a personal experience that resonates with a lot of probably will resonate with a lot of black readers, but also there's the history, right. right? Mm -hmm. And social commentary that people aren't aware of. Like even one of my agents, who's a black man, my talent agent, he was like, oh my goodness. When he read the book, he was like, there was all this I did not know. Mm. You know, so so that's why I feel like there's something in the book for everybody. Like people are going to read it and be like, oh, 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 you know, and I try to make it like an easy read. Right. I also try to make it hopeful as well. And just that, you know, we all have a part in making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. 
and so uh, tell us a little bit about that call to action, you know, and and what it is that that people can do in their day to day life. Yeah, I think definitely like on an individual level, you know, I would say even to health professionals sort of thinking about, you know, what are some of the biases that we hold that we don't even realize we hold, like kind of educating yourselves, like doing a lot of reading, not just doing trainings, but like being very reflective and thinking about how that impacts how we care for our patients. Because we do have data that shows that like black patients are more likely to be spoken over when they're talking to their doctor. Um, they're less likely to be listened to. And that leads to delayed diagnoses or misdiagnoses and sometimes harm and death, right? So there's that individual level work that we have to do that I think we could do at home, we could do with our family and friends. But then there's the institutional work where we need to keep, you know, have processes, sometimes standard processes in place to make sure that all of our patients are receiving equitable care. So for example, there was an emergency department I was working for, I won't say which one, but they noted that their Black patients were waiting 80 minutes longer to get admitted to the hospital from the ER than other patients. Hmm. And wow. so we talked about what are some things that we can put, what are reminders we can put in the EMR, what's a, a dashboard only for that health professional that they can see how that compares to other patients they're caring for. So I do think there's that inner work that we can do, but then there is the organizational practices and then I think it's just educating yourself on when you see your patient. I think in medical school, we only think about the patient-physician relationship. We don't realize when we're taking care of our patients, everything is in the room with us, what's mm -hmm. happening in their community, right? What kind of job they have, right? Um, you know, are they housing insecure, right? Like all of that we know impacts health. So to have a broader view of our patients than just like, the individual decisions they're making or what we're going to prescribe for them or what surgery we're going to do. We want to really right. understand how they're living. I love that. That speaks to some of what we talk about, you know, of just remembering that the human <laughs> in front of you, yes. right. And that yes. they are connected to other humans and to a whole environment. And they're more than just whatever the pathology is that brought them in. And you have to yes. consider all of it. I love that. Exactly. Exactly. And we also uh, need, you know, on an organizational level, people to buy in, like leadership to buy yeah. in to this, which it seems you. seems like a, a much a much harder, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing to overcome because there's a yes. there's a lot of especially lately it seems there's been a lot of um, people downplaying the role that diversity can can have in I medicine know. and academia. I know. I know. So we really need to hold our leaders accountable and to tell them, like, like, we expect you to uphold these certain values. And part of the values are making sure that everyone is getting the care that they need or that we have workplaces where everyone can thrive and not just survive in them. So, yes, definitely we need buy in, but from leadership, because we know that 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 any changes that happen have to ha happen from the top down. Yeah. Right. It just seems like something that you shouldn't have to argue. Right. That everyone should I get health care. Yeah. Good health care. Yeah. I like, know. I know. It's so simple. I know, yeah. but it's so but, frustrating. But yeah. Yeah. Well, let's um let's take another break and then we'll come back with Dr. Blackstock. Hey Kristen. Yeah. Our anniversary is coming up. Yes, that's right. You know what I got you? What? A bouquet. Uh, oh, you shouldn't have. They're Diba Dex mites. That's why you and shouldn't look have. Look how cute those faces are, and uh, the little legs. It is kind of cute. I have you know to what admit. these things do? What? They cause you to have like itchy, red, irritated eyelids. That's not cute. Well, it's a disease. It's actually a pretty common disease called Demodex blepharitis. Yeah. How do you know if you have it? What does it look like? Well, you, you end up with this crusty, flaky buildup on your eyelashes. And it's pretty easy to see if you just look at That's them under a microscope. Pretty gross, though. Yeah, yeah. So... Well, you don't get grossed out. Okay. You got to get checked out. Okay. That's ah, a fair yeah. point. Yeah. You got you to right. go in. You gotta, right. and, and, and we'll look at your eyelids. You just go to eyelidcheck.com to get more information. All okay. right. That's E-Y-E-L-I-D check.com to get more information about Demodex blepharitis. These cute little guys. Yeah. It's the most romantic go. anniversary gift that's, you've ever given me. You're welcome. All right, we are here with Dr. Blackstock, and uh, before we before we wrap up, um, Uche, what we sometimes will do is just read. We get lots of stories because we're kind of a storytelling type of pod yes. pod pod podcast. 
You'd think a podcast I'd be able to speak. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, we do have a story uh, today from a listener named Barbara. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna read this together. I, I I do cold readings on this, so just warning: I have not read this at all. I have no idea what's gonna happen here. We're just gonna take it as it comes. All right. Barbara says, "I was recently hospitalized, and every morning the attending rounded with interns and medical students. After everyone examined me, the attending would ask the students questions. The other day, he asked questions about lymph nodes and turned to me and said, "Sorry, shop talk." And I replied, "That's fine. I'm just waiting for you to ask them about the Krebs cycle." They Whoa. were they they all they were bursts of laughter, and the attending asked me how I knew about the Krebs cycle. Why, Doctor Glockenflecken? I replied. The attending. <laughs> <laughs> the attending accused me of giving the students PTSD. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. Uh, how much do you remember about the Krebs cycle, Uche? I remember absolutely <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and, that, so I, yeah. and, and I'm not ashamed to say. It's just that I never, I mean, honestly, I, I, I never used it in the emergency department. Who um, does use it? Does it get used? Clinical geneticist, probably. I don't okay. know. Okay. Something right, like there that. You go. It just seems I, bizarre yeah. that you all have to learn it, and I've not heard one person say they ever right. use it. <laughs> but actually, I, that leads to another question: just the practice of medicine. Are do you do you? How much do you miss it? How much do you? Mm. I know. Paying I for know. the days of like uh, you know long night shifts and <laughs> <laughs> none, none at all. No, no, and that's just because no, no, no. I. When I when I um, was practicing, I loved it. I enjoyed it, yeah. and I, I I do miss the patient, the connections with patients. Even though in the ER we have these very brief, intense interactions with our mm -hmm. patients, like I really loved it, and I loved being there for them. But I feel like now some of the work that I'm doing has a, a different kind of impact, and that's just what yeah. right now, like the mindset that I'm in. Yeah, I think it's it's just great to to leave clinical medicine, but still like find a way to have even bigger impact yes, on patient yeah. care. Well, and look at yes, that. I mean, yes. your, your department didn't really want you to be doing the work that they hired you to do. And you would, <laughs> you but if you had been able to do it, you would have done it at that one place. And now look, your, your impact yes. is so much broader I than know. if you had just, you know, stayed on the, what was the plan? So yes, I made, I made one of the best decisions ever. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I love what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So the book is called legacy. A black physician reckons with racism in, in medicine. And so, um, and it's out today. That's it's right. out now. So go definitely it. go check it out. Uh, yes. It's just a wonderful story. And thank you for writing it and for putting yourself out there because I know that's, that's tough to, you know, talk about some of the things you've been through. Yes. And, yeah. And, but, yeah. but I, I can tell you, you know, after, you know, we talk about my cardiac arrest and cancer stuff and I, I get so many messages from people like, like, thanks for putting that out there. I'm sure yeah. you probably get the same thing. Same, same. They feel seen, yeah. they feel affirmed and that's like the best feeling ever. And that, yeah. that alone is, is a, it can be a huge part of advocacy, yeah. right? Just, yes. just putting yes. that out there and, and letting people know that they, yes. that there are other people like you, you know? So, yes, exactly. Um, Anything else? Uh, Where can people find you yeah, if they want to learn absolutely. more? Okay, they can find me on Twitter at Uche at U-C-H-E underscore Blackstock or on Instagram at Uche Blackstock MD. And I just want to thank you both. I had, this was so much fun. It was. Thank you so much for an engaging and fun conversation. Yeah. Thank you. It's, Thanks was, for coming on. We are honored to have you. Absolutely. It's great. It's great to finally see you in person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've seen, and uh, I've seen your TV spots. And your contributions on social media, you're, yeah. um, you got everything I know, I going feel on. like we know you because we've been following <laughs> you for right. so same, long. But... Same, same. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Oh, what a fascinating conversation. It really, really is. And it's important work she's doing. Yeah, does it make you uh, uh, want to write a book? I do want to write a book, but I'm also terrified to write a book and I don't know how any of it works. And I'm kind of like, like when she was saying her agent said, I think you have a story to tell. I feel like I have a story to tell, yeah. but I don't know how to go about doing it. Oh, so yeah. no, I, I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely, I want to get her book as soon as yes, it comes out. Yes, I do too. So it it, when this so episode, it'll be a good reminder once this episode comes out. Oh, the book's out. Yep. Let's go Time get it. Time to buy it. So everybody really should check it out. Um, and uh, I, just a fascinating story. I love hearing stories. Yeah, stories. we were so fascinated by her that we just skipped right over the game because because we did, I know we spent I, the time on the stories. So we we had an emergency medicine uh, related emergency surgery type game to play, but you know chances are we'll have somebody else who can talk about yeah. emergencies. 
better than me. Yeah, but we felt like she what she had to say was more important than <laughs> yes, our absolutely. jump game that we had. So, <laughs> um, And let us know what you guys uh, think of the episode. And do you have any suggestions for uh, guests? Uh, we'd love, we love hearing, you know, people who just have, you know, that do things that are, you know, outside the box. Yeah. And it was really cool hearing her pivot about her mm-hmm. pivot out of academic medicine. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, I think nowadays that's going to so uh, many be people interesting are to that. a lot of people. Yeah. Everyone's talking, everyone's talking about side gigs and yeah. like trying to, you know, but to like take that leap where I'm not even like, and I, you know, admittedly have a side gig, but, yep. but, but I'm not even like, to quit medicine that sound that seems so scary to like i know to to just totally change gears and yeah. and i don't know it's more you know yeah, credit to dr blackstock i did in grad school and it was the most terrifying thing ever because you just don't know what it's just a black void that you're yeah. launching out into so yeah uh yeah credit to her for for but she's, doing what she's doing she's instead still, still making a difference you know and a and, bigger one than uh, she could have that's otherwise right. Uh, all right, so uh, there's lots of ways you can reach out to us. Did you know that? You can email us, knockknockhi at human-content.com. You can send all your uh, suggestions and things uh, that you want. Uh, you can also visit us on all our social media platforms. You can hang out with us in the Human Content Podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at Human Content Pods. Thanks to all the wonderful listeners, all of you guys. You're all, you're all of you, all of you are leaving feedback. Wonderful feedback, I hear. <laughs> That's great. And reviews. They're all great. They're all awesome. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Like at WSU1038 on YouTube said, this is the first Knock Knock High episode. Great guests. This is my first Knock Knock High episode, I should say. Great guests. I follow them too. You and Mrs. G seem to be a good match. Well, good, because we're working together and yeah. we're married. And we're stuck. And we're stuck, stuck with each together other. Stuck together in this room. Not literally stuck together. We're not conjoined <laughs> husband and wife, but uh, metaphorically. That you can tell. People have never seen her legs. Figuratively. Well, that's you true. You never know. Um, it's a three-legged race down here. <laughs> she, she, uh, uh, WC1038 said that about the um, Dr. Paul Zalzal and Dr. Brad Weening episode. Ah, oh, the Talking with Docs guy. Talking with Docs. The yeah. orthos. They were fun. The Ortho Bros. Uh, full episodes of this podcast are up on my YouTube channel every week at D Glock and Plekin, in case you want to know what we look like. And uh, we also have a Patreon. Lots of cool perks, bonus episodes. We react to medical shows and movies. You can hang out with us and the other members of our little growing community, mm-hmm. our little township, our, uh, our 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 village. Which should should I say the? Uh, are we have a, are we a city level? Are we going to have to buy, you know, those social media posts that you see sometimes? It's like, you know, there's an entire village in Spain that's for sale for one euro or whatever. Okay. Okay. The Glock flock is not for sale. No, I'm saying, are you going to make us buy some land Ooh, somewhere? And so that we can all live with our patrons? For this village. Absolutely. You keep talking about it as though it's It's, it's a, a good place. idea. Would you, as a, a uh, patrons, uh, let, let me know over on Patreon. Do you want to live with us? <laughs> Do you, do you, how much? I promise you, you do not. How much? You, do you might think you do, but you don't know what happens over here. Ooh, all right. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Early ad free episode access, interactive QA, live stream events, much more. Patreon.com slash Glock and Plekin or go to Glock and Speaking of Patreon community perks, new members shout out to Omar P, Anthony C, Kim Y, and Jennifer B. Welcome, Welcome. to all of you. We love having you. As always, a virtual shout out to the Jonathans. Actually, it's not a virtual. It's a real shout out. This is, is virtual. This is a shout out. Anyway, shout out to all the Jonathans. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Stephen G, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Leah D, K, L, Rachel L, Keith G, J, J, H, Derek, and Mary H, Susanna F, Muhammad K, Aviga, Parker, Ryan, Michael Meg, Bubbly Salt, and Pink. Pink. Macho. We got to meet Pink Macho. We did. We met Pink that Macho. That was one of the highlights of at our live the show whole thing for in me. December. Yep. It was great. It was so cute because she just came up and was talking to us and we so, took a picture so, or whatnot. Oh, and she goes, oh, by the way, I'm Pink Macho. Oh, by the way, I'm Pink Macho. Like, just threw that the out way, there. By the way, no, you start with that. Yeah, you lead with Pink Macho. That's right. Patreon roulette. Random shout out to someone on the emergency medicine tier. We got Jonathan G. Thank you, Jonathan, for being a patron. And thank you all for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Flecken. Special thanks to our guest today, Dr. Uche Blackstock. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Broncolini, Corny, <laughs> Rob Goldblin Goblin, uh, Shanti Creek Brook. 
<laughs> what is happening? Someone uh, knows that I will read anything <laughs> on this page and, um, and added some nicknames for our producers. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure. I'm assuming it was I, uh, Rob Goblin Goldman, <laughs> or it could have been Aaron Broccolini. Yeah, Corny. either one of those. I would either one. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't put it past Shanti Creek Brook either. Yeah. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portiz. Our music is by Omer Binsby. To learn about our Night Night Highs program disclaimer, ethics policy, submission verification, licensing terms, HIPAA release terms. I've never. Have you read the submission licensing terms? I've. Or is it submission verification and licensing terms? Submission. Is a, is this a licensing term? I think you're overthinking this. Maybe, but I I'm sure someone's interested. <laughs> no, no one's interested. <laughs> you can go to people Glockham, in law school. <laughs> Glockenflecken.com or reach out to us, knackknackhi at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. Knackknackhi is a human content production. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. You know, sometimes I come home from work and I just like feel really run down. Yeah. Because, you know, despite popular opinion, you actually do see a fair number of patients every day. <laughs> I do. I, my clinics are pretty busy, but I'm not the only physician that feels that way. Mm-hmm. So many people feel overwhelmed and burdened so much that work-life balance feels impossible. Yeah. Nobody gets into this job for the paperwork. Most people. Not, definitely not me. Mm. And uh, But let me tell you about the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, or DAX for short. Tell me. This is AI-powered ambient technology. It sits there in the room with you. It's transforming healthcare with clinical documentation that writes itself. Ooh, that sounds nice. It's like having a Jonathan there. Yeah, it's perfect. I got, and I got some stats for you. Ooh, I love stats. You're going to love this. Seven minutes is saved per encounter by reducing clinical documentation time by 50%. Seven minutes. That's an entire surgery for you. Yeah, that's what DAX can do for you. And uh, across all specialties, 70% of physicians report a reduction in feelings of burnout and fatigue. That's pretty incredible. It really is cool technology. Uh, To learn more about the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience or DAX, visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.